Hello and welcome back. If you follow the channel, you know that we are involved in the restoration of an amazing mechanical analog computer from early fighter jets, the Bendix MG1. This computer is one of the first iterations of an air data computer, a machine able to calculate all kinds of important parameters such as the altitude, Mach number, air density and true air speed of early supersonic jets. We opened it up and marveled at it in part 1, Master Ken explained how it works in part 2, and we did a deep dive on its synchros in part 3, of which it uses many. In this episode, we are finally going to pair some of it up. We are going to start with the temperature calculation section. As you'll see, that will prove more difficult than anticipated, and the help of another marvel of a modern gadget, my new miniature infrared camera, will be very welcome. Before we got to the power-up point, Master Ken had the unenviable task of figuring out what was connected to what. In particular, trying to figure out how the many synchros were connected was a huge problem. There is no place to probe them, and they are all over the place, some in the bowels of the machine. Ken came up with the idea of trying to identify them with a thermal camera. So I finally got an instrument that I wanted for a long time, which is a thermal camera. I had been missing that. And this one has been uh, donated for review by Top Dawn. It's called the TC View. Uh, it comes in this nice case, which is has another case inside, which I already opened. Uh, and they have them both for iOS and Android. Mine is iOS, but I was surprised at how easy it was to set up. Plug it in. Turn the phone on and then there you go. It recognized it. Thermal imaging. And it takes a second. And ta-da! Here's my hand. It's pretty remarkable how you know, simple the setup is. And I can't remember the um, resolution. It's a few hundred pixels each way. So there, it's kind of medium. There are some lower ones, there are some higher ones. Uh, but that seems to work plenty fine. And our boy Ken needs me to uh, use it on this incredibly complicated machine. So what do you want me to look at? So, so basically I'm trying to figure out how the wiring matches onto the synchros. So I've powered up one of the synchros and I'm hoping that the one watt of energy going into it will heat it up enough that we can tell which one is energized. So, the so these round cylinders are the synchros. So, so from the back, you think? So one of them should be hotter. Okay, let's look. So I don't know if one watt is going to be enough to make a difference in temperature. Uh, I certainly see these one powered. Those are the ones I was thinking would be powered. I'm, I'm really impressed of how sensitive that is. So this is 22.2 degrees C. And then the thing that's blue is next to it's 21.5. Okay, so I disconnected the power, so are they cooling off? They are. They are. So right. Can you power it back up? Okay, I'll power it. Or back up and the temperature should start to climb. There's something else that's bright, but that's what's the stuff behind. Oh, that's the scope. Ah, and on the scope, you can tell the uh, on the LCD screen, it's way warmer here than it's here. Illumination or the electronics are at the bottom. So, you found another one? Yep, I. I hooked up power to what it says is the, the mock. Mm -hmm. indicator and I'm noticing that this one is getting nice and warm. So I wonder if I, you can detect by hand, not really. No. It's not enough to be picked up by hand. So yeah, can, can you can you try this one? See if it's if it's cold? Yeah, it looks it's cold, yeah. It's cold. Go on this one again. And this one it's Yeah, and, and, and it's impossible to tell by hand. I had the finger the trick wouldn't do it, so it's it's really... So yeah, this is nice. Amazingly good. It's amazing how much progress has happened in thermal cameras. This used to cost thousands of dollars for a blurry 50-ish pixel resolution. 
Now you can get this high quality one for less than $300 and hook it up to your Android or iPhone. It was particularly good at picking up very slight temperature differences of a fraction of a degree, something completely impossible to do by hand. Anyhow, the camera got adopted instantly and we are using it now for all sorts of purposes. So we have Mr. Ken, Hi. Professor Ken, Master Ken. So we have Master Ken <laughs> and uh, you're about to attempt to power your Bendix thingy. So yes, we're going to power this up with 115 volts AC and see what happens. So we're not powering up the whole thing. Uh, it's more modular than you might expect. We're powering up this wedge here, which is the temperature input. What it does is it takes temperature from a platinum sensor and converts that temperature into a rotation on this output gear here. So this whole collection of gears and electronics is just doing that, converting temperature to rotation. The way it works is there's a variable resistor here. This motor rotates the gear train until the variable resistor matches the input resistance. Um, the rotation goes through a correction cam here to the output. And then this electronics is a magnetic amplifier that drives the motor based on the input. So basically an op amp to drive the motor one way or another, depending on whether we need to rotate one way or the other. So it's a big servo loop exactly. basically to transform the resistance into a rotation. So we're going to power it up and what we expect is that this gear will turn to a, a position that depends on the resistance we're feeding into it. Okay. And on the instrumentation side, we have a uh, box of a decayed resistor to simulate the temperature probe. We don't have the temperature probe attached yet. And we have 115 volts over there and AC, 115 volts AC. And we have 26.5 volt DC for some relays in there. So, so these relays allow them to switch in a fixed resistance. You can test the system to make sure it's calibrated. Oh, okay, so, 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 so we start in. with a relay then? You can hear the relay clicking as I give it the power. Okay, should we start with a relay? Or I a don't know if it's normally live or normally calibration. Oh. My, my guess is they would want it normally live, so if you lose power to the relay, you have what you want, not the calibration temperature. I think so too. Okay, let's try it. One, two, three. Ah, I hear it on the volts. Happening. Search for the relay. Oh, you tell me. No action. All right. So try number two. We switched a few wires around. Um, ready. Happy. Okay, so Master Ken needs to do a little bit more reverse engineering and in order to get to the boards we have to take a few things apart. But it turns out it's very modular. The first thing you do, you take that platform off. It only meshes through two gears, which we locked so we wouldn't lose the, the timing. The whole electronics comes off in one piece. And same thing here, there was another piece of electronics and it's connectorized. So you take the screws and you take it out. This is the servo to control the temperature and this is the servo for the um, pressure correction because your pressure readings vary a bit depending on angle of attack. You told me from the other ones you saw this is probably a mag amp? Yeah, yeah, yeah there's um, two mag amps here um, controlled by transistors and so then these will turn the motor one way or another. Oh these are the mag amps right there. Yeah and then there's a power supply transformer up here I, I spied a few transistors and they're not many and then there are some some components that uh, look, look dodgy yeah here's one a very fuzzy one over there yeah, you see it right there this guy all right see you in a month <laughs> see you tomorrow oh tomorrow okay <laughs> One week later. We're back. 
with Master Ken and uh, you have uh, reverse engineered the schematic some so more. I reverse engineered it in this tiny diagram. Beautiful. So this is what you start with and then you somehow semi-detangle it to this. Right, I start with the physical layout of the components and the wires and then turn it into a logical layout. Mm -hmm. So the basic idea is it has a Wheatstone bridge to balance the resistance of the sensor input, the temperature probe, and the feedback resistor. And then that's coupled by a transformer. It goes through three transistor stages, which are amplifiers and bandpass filters. And then it goes to the magamp stage, which generates the signal to drive the motor, to turn it one way or the other, to bring it back into, into alignment. So it's basically a, a feedback servo loop. So, so the, these are the magamps. Huh, magic components. But what are these mysterious magamps, you ask? They are an ingenious way to control a large AC current with a small DC current. Sort of a DC to AC transistor made with magnetic magic. They were widely used for AC motor control before the advent of high power transistors. The basic magamp circuit looks like a transformer, but don't be fooled, it is not a transformer at all. It is a variable inductor, which exploits what is usually a very undesirable property of a transformer core, magnetic saturation. Imagine that no current is applied to the control side on the left. The winding on the right, the AC side of the circuit, is just a simple inductor. If we were to connect it to an AC source and light bulb like here, the inductor's high impedance would prevent most of the AC current from flowing through it. Our light would be mostly off. But iron cores are notoriously imperfect, which makes inductors and transformers so complicated. Cores work up to a point, but if the magnetic field in the core becomes too high, they saturate and stop working altogether. It is usually an effect you want to avoid. But here, the core is made specially to enhance this bad property. It saturates very abruptly. So if we now put enough DC current on the left winding, we'll eventually bring the level of magnetization of the core above its saturation. At that point, the core basically stops to work altogether. Suddenly, the large inductance of the AC winding on the right drops to almost nothing, as if it had no core. Its AC impedance becomes that of a low resistance wire, and our lamp lights up. Magic! Note that the circuit would not work as drawn, as one of the AC phases would tend to oppose the DC field and take the core out of saturation during half a period. So magamps with single windings need a diode in the AC part to work correctly. Here is a circuit that would actually work. In practice, a simple trick allows them to work with full wave AC. You just put two windings in series. Each one works on half of the AC wave. This is why magamps usually have three windings, with a DC control winding in the middle and two AC windings on the outside. So you get the idea, with a small DC current, you can control a larger AC one, although neither with high fidelity nor very good on-off ratio. But none of that matters for our crude motor control application. Right, and we, you think we were missing a ground? Is that the problem? Well, that, that's one of our problems. Okay. That uh, I think we need to hook up the uh, uh, hook up an additional ground for the sensor. Mm -hmm. Ready? Okay. Here. So we have air, but we don't have output. This one. Okay. The air is changing, but the output's not changing. Do do it again on off. Yeah, look the, uh, the your, your drive signal didn't budge. Do it again. So your magamp is not magamping. You should have jumped super high. Oh wait, it's actually turning. It's. It is. Oh yeah, it is. But very very slowly. So we had a little bit of motion, but I didn't see the output of the magamp change at all. 
That's very suspicious. Should should we go through each stage? We should we should see it come through, right? Right. Do you want to do the thermal camera while we have it powered up? Yeah, let's do the thermal camera. Capture record screen. Okay. And do you see something? Oh, I do see so something. So look, look this way. So everything looks very hot. Over here, although it's it's not right. Medium. But here it's really striking, where you can tell exactly which synchro is operating. Yeah, it's, it's sort of fun to see your lab, and so that those are the two HP units that are on, and that's the screen. Ha! Huh. Even that screen's warm. The lab is infrared. Pretty cool for a very reasonably priced camera. Those used to cost a fortune. But not Soon after. So can you think you have narrowed it down to a bad transistor? Yeah, I think it's this transistor here. Um, this is the third stage in the amplifier. The input looks nice and there's no output. Mm -hmm. So the finger of blame is pointing at the transistor at this point. <laughs> okay. Uh, germanium but NPN, right? I or believe PNP. it's germanium. Yeah, yeah, it's NPN. Okay. So here's our transistor. But... It's innocent. It's a good transistor. So not that. You found something else? Yeah, the transistor seems to be innocent. Um, so my focus now moved to this capacitor here, which was the only thing I could think of that could be um, shorting out the signal. So in the circuit, it's um, the output coupling from the amplifier to the next stage to the mag amps. So I disconnected one lead of the capacitor and now we get a nice um, 10 volt output from our oscillate, uh, from our amplifier. So and if you reconnect, if you if reconnect I reconnect it, it, the signal just goes away. Okay. So this that. capacitor is eating the signal. It, huh. looks, it looks fine on the ohm meter. It doesn't seem to be shorted, but so on the cap on the capacitor meter, let me turn it on. So if you're not careful, it's a great capacitor. Right, it's 8.57 microfarad. And if you try resistance, ESRs are not bad, 4 ohms. But if you try parallel resistance, it gives you 80 ohms. Which is really weird, and it doesn't show up on the ohm meter. Right, it's, it's infinite on the ohm meter, but in circuit it's, it's almost a, a short. Wow, weird. So Ken replaced the weirdly failed capacitor and expected the thing to finally work, but it did not. Can you replace a capacitor and that didn't help so much? Right, I took out this capacitor which seemed to be shorted and replaced it with a more modern electrolytic capacitor and that helped somewhat but it did not solve the problem. The problem moved on to the next part of the circuit where there seems to be another bad capacitor. Moments later. So I, I heard some beautiful noises. What did you do, Ken? Well, I cut the bad capacitor out of the circuit and temporarily wired in a new capacitor. So that's the second one you changed? Right. And now if you look at the output gear here, when I change the input resistance, the gear turns to a fixed position. So oh. the servo loop seems to be servoing. Wow. So, so, so two bad caps, then two bad tantalum caps. Yeah, I think the, se the second one failed and then that reverse biased the first one and killed it. Huh. Give it, give it a crank, yeah. Wow, it corrects quickly. Wow, it's nicely servoing. Sweet. So I, I ended up replacing all the capacitors. They, they looked really bad somewhere. Quite corroded inside. Uh, like this one, you could look under the microscope. One side of the package was corroded. And that is the worst capacitor, the one that was hanging up everything. And you say, Ken, it was very shorted? Yeah, it was like, shorted zero ohms across it until I removed it from the circuit and then it measured much better. And so and now it's not zero anymore so at all. So I'm suspecting it was like a external corrosion that I dislodged. Either that or heating it up from the, the soldering 
Yeah, so th that would make sense that it is actually, yeah, it's perfectly good. So it might make sense that with, with all the corrosion we saw outside, the corrosion is actually external. external. And then when we wiggle them up, because none of them measures bad now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it still didn't work in the circuit at that point, but... Um, oh, it was still bad in the circuit, although it measured not right. short anymore? Yeah, so it may have been... Oh, you, you're ruining my simple explanation oh, there. Oh, sorry. So, I, I, something happened to those gaps. That's mm -hmm. not obvious. More moments later. Okay, it's all hooked up. Uh, Ken, you want to turn on your beast and demonstrate? Okay. So we're simulating the temperature sensor with the resistor box here. So when we change the resistance, the temperature servo adjusts, the synchro output is driving our display here. And we get a, a nice temperature reading. It's getting hot really quick. The display units uh, are not scaled. Yeah, it goes up to like 480 Celsius. Yeah, so that's really for supersonic flight. And our indicator is not. That would be the total air temperature as a static air, by the way. Yeah. Nose person or a cold nose person? Am I still alive? You are a hands warm. Uh, you, well, your nose, some part of your nose is warm and some part of your nose is cold. <laughs> <laughs> You're a mixed person. <laughs>